Welcome into the PFN Bengals podcast. I am Dallas Robinson. He is Jay Morrison. Jay, the Bengals have unfortunately done it again. They start off the season with another disappointing loss, 0-1 after a 16-10 loss to the New England Patriots on Sunday. It's it's hard to know even where to start with this one, Jay, because it's almost like we could see it coming a mile away. The Bengals have been so poor at the beginning of seasons. Joe Burrow has gotten off to slow starts at the beginning of seasons, but kind of felt with a with a full regular offseason for Joe Burrow going against a team in the Patriots who many people had as the worst team in the NFL. The Bengals were 8.5 point favorites. I, it was hard to see this type of loss coming, I think, but incredibly disappointing start for the Bengals once again. Yeah, I mean, I took the Bengals in my survivor pool. I, I, I thought New England would cover. I thought this was going to be a closer game than most people thought, but I didn't think the, the Bengals were going to lose. But you think about it, I mean, they – they had to change their game plan significantly. I, I, I don't think they ever thought Jamar was not going to play. Um, but then he gets sick. He gets food poisoning. He said food poisoning Saturday morning. So he wasn't 100%. And then losing T on Thursday, I think, was a really big deal. I think he was going to be a big part of that game plan. Why wouldn't he be? He's, he's a great receiver. And then the other thing, I mean, that, that game looked a lot like last year's opener. And there was no rain. There was no calf injury to blame. Joe Burrow just just did not look right. And, and, you know, you watch the broadcast, you see him shaking his wrist and looking at it. And, you know, we we thought he looked pretty good in training camp and he was making all the throws he needed to make. But they did kind of back off the deep throws later in training camp. And so you have to wonder, you know, is that wrist bothering him more than anybody's letting on? And I don't I don't want to make too much of this, but I did notice this and I I I can't say I've always watched for it but I've never noticed it before. Jake Browning was up and throwing multiple times on the sideline in that game. And I don't know if it was just to stay loose just in case or if if Burrow was saying that the wrist was bo- – you know, the, we'll, we'll talk to Joe tomorrow at, at his weekly news conference. But there was just a lot that didn't really add up, just a very uncharacteristic day for Joe Burrow. It was, and it, it reminded me – of something you said last season, Jay, when when Joe was dealing with the calf strain and it looked like he couldn't move at the beginning of last season. And and I remember you saying, it's maybe not that he couldn't move, it's the mental block, right? Mm -hmm. It's the getting back into the swing of things. And it it seems like this happens to Joe Burrow every year, injury or not, that it takes him a little while at the beginning of the year to get back into that rhythm. And I think we, we saw that again against the Patriots. He was consistently throwing short of the sticks. It looked like you know, even on third downs where they needed to get the yardage, he was just honing in on receivers that were not past the sticks and it wasn't going to give them any chance to, to get the yardage they needed. We can talk about that that series at the end of the game where the Bengals were backed up and needed to get, you know, needed to get a touchdown and looked like Joe Burrow had several options deep, whether it was under Yoshivas or Jamar Chase on a few of those last second plays near the end of the game and, and didn't go for him. It looked like Burrow was kind of seeing pressure that wasn't there. You hate to see a guy like say a guy like Burrow was seeing ghosts, but it felt like he was reacting constantly to pressure that was not there. He was he was barely pressured this week at all. Twenty two point nine percent pressure week pressure rate, twenty seventh among all quarterbacks in in week one. He still took three sacks on just eight pressures. I mean, he looked like he didn't know what to do when when pressure was there or whether whether it wasn't there. He did make some nice throws. I thought a couple of nice throws, but for the most part. It just did not look like the quarterback that we've come accustomed to seeing. I think you're totally right. Yeah, in, in his head, I think. And then just the the decision-making to to let it go and, and take some shots. And, mm-hmm. you know, you go back to that that third down, on third and 10 with the game on the line on their final drive, and he the receivers outside weren't wide open, but they had one-on-one coverage. And you Burrow goes for that nine times out of 10. He takes that shot. I mean, a a third and 10 check down to the running back and and against that New England defense, that's never going to work. And it, it was it was almost like he's playing not to lose where yeah. they they got behind and he knew, they all knew, one, one more turnover was going to seal it. And it was just this, they were playing way too safe and, and Burrow in particular with, with his decision on where to go with the ball. And um, it, there, the pressure thing's a good point. And, and you notice that, you know, second play of the game, Trent Brown just gets whipped. And then Burrow gets yeah. hit from behind on the wrist. Maybe that was what led to everything. He fumbled. He got the ball back. But you get you, that happens on the second play of the game. That's got to yeah. be in your head. And then that that first the first down 
on, or no, I'm sorry, the third down when he checked it down, Trent Brown got bull rushed and there was such separate. I mean, the, the, the court, the, def- the defensive end did not get to Burrow, but there was such separation where that's one where if, if, he, Trent Brown just maintains contact. Even if he gets walked back, that's where Burrow escapes to the right and he can make that off script throw on the run. And he just he couldn't take that chance of trying to roll out to the right because there was such separation between the, the defender and Trent Brown that, that he could have closed easy on him. So there was just a lot that played into it. But, um, you know, Joe Burrow, this is going to have to be a bounce back game. He's, he's going to have something to prove at Kansas City on Sunday. And I thought there were stretches like where he got into a little bit of a rhythm. Like after halftime, there was there was a stretch where he completed four straight passes to to Chase, Irwin, Brown, and Gasicki. Mm-hmm. But it was still all short stuff. There, there was nothing down the field. And right after that came came that fourth and two call that, that we've talked about. That it, it seems like Joe Burrow checked into that fourth and two call he into did. a wide receiver. Okay, he checked into that to a wide receiver screen to Andre Yoshivas. Just did not make any sense. To me, I mean, Jamar Chase is blocking on a critical fourth and down play. You have no numbers advantage on that side of the field. You throw short of the sticks. Yoshivas has to like turn around to catch the ball and then try to get up field and beat somebody. It just, it, it didn't make a lot of sense from that perspective. And I think that was just one of several mistakes. Burrow just not taking any shots down the field was incredibly surprising. Zach talked about that, you know, after the game and, and yesterday saying it's tough. You can play it a couple different ways. We'll coach it up, decide what we do on, on long distance plays going forward. It seemed to me like Zach was kind of saying that maybe Joe should have taken some more deep shots, maybe not coming out right out and saying that, but kind of reading between the lines. Mm-hmm. Bengals had no ex- two explosive plays all game, one run and one pass. The only other team in the NFL in week one that had two explosive plays was the Chicago Bears, who looked awful on offense. <laughs> the Bengals' second longest play of the game was the 20-yard pass interference that Andre Yoshivas drew. It'd be, it'd be, yeah. Beyond that, there was this, the Jamar Chase 28-yard run. It just, there was they were not able to get anything going down the field. Then on top of that, you add these self-inflicted errors, right? You've got Mike Gesicki, who should have come down with a touchdown in the end zone. Right after that, Tanner Hudson fumbles and costs the Bengals points. Charlie Jones fumbles and gives the mm. gives the Patriots three free points. You, you can't have a lack of explosive plays and the self inflicted errors. Like you, you can play a safe game where you're keeping control of the ball and doing everything right and not going for the for the kind of bigger plays. You can't do both of those things, right? You can't not yeah. get big plays and give the ball away. And I, I think when you're doing that, you you get a result like you had on Sunday. Yeah, and the, the Charlie Jones fumble. I mean, yeah, the Hudson fumble was critical because he's a, a yard away from scoring, and it just didn't make any sense. But the Charlie Jones one is the one that really stung him because they they had a good defensive series to get the ball back to start the third quarter, and then we saw what they did when they actually got the ball and, and, and were after the the field goal after the Charlie Jones fumble, and, and that's when they finally put a drive together and went down and scored. And it felt like they were getting something going there, and that. That was just brutal, and, and that you know that one too. That's that's the one that that turned it into a, a two possession game, and that's that's why Zach had to kick the fifty one yarder after the big play from 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 Jamar Chase, and it just that's that's Joe as good as Joe Burrow is at closing games and, and and rallying the team in the fourth quarter. It's just not where you want to be in an opener where everybody's trying to find their way and shake the rust off, and it was just a. A confluence of unfortunate events. The fumbles can't happen. I mean, they only lost two fumbles all last year. Right. Franchise record, fewest in the NFL, and and now two in one game. And then the the Yoshivas fourth and two. That's a turnover. Turnover on downs. And you know, you mentioned it. Uh, Jamar Chase had a good block. Trent Irwin had a good block. Yeah. That play was set up. Jonathan Jones just made a hell of a play, and Yoshivas made a hell of a mistake. He, he's got to go to one side or the other of him and then let him grab him, and he can at least carry him for another yard. You run straight into him face up. Jones was able to just stone him and, and drop him right there. And you know they the, both Dan Pitcher and, and Zach Taylor were pretty critical of, you know, we've got to get that. That was not a bad check. That I don't know what the original play was, but we've seen him do that in the past. We've seen him throw – wide receiver screens to, or not, well, I mean, I guess bubble screens to, to CJ mm-hmm. Uzama and, and you've got Chase Block. And I mean, he's a physical guy. It's, yeah, you'd like to to see him get the ball in a situation like that, but the defense is totally expecting it. So to get him out there and get a key block, I didn't think that was a bad play call by Joe. I just, it was really poor execution. 
I do think we have to give some credit to this Patriots defense too. You know, they yeah, they were a really really good unit last year. They they traded Matthew Jude on this offseason. They they lost Christian Barmore, so that affects the front, but that secondary is still really good. You mentioned Jonathan mm-hmm. Jones, Christian Gonzalez had a really nice game for the Patriots against Jamar Chase. Kyle Duggar obviously is a playmaker who caused that fumble mm-hmm. against Tanner Hudson. They've still got a lot of good secondary players back there. So I think it, as bad as it looked for the Bengals and and the route combinations and guys getting open and the lack of stuff downfield, I, I do think there has to be a little credit given towards the Patriots uh, from that regard. What do you think about the rushing game, Jay? I, I thought Zach Moss looked pretty good. Uh, you know, he, I thought he looked broke some tackles, got got a little bit of work in the receiving game. I thought the offensive line was actually pretty decent too. Uh, Outside yeah. of Trent Brown, Trent Brown gave up four pressures in the, in the passing game. Um, thought he, thought he, you mentioned earlier, he had a couple rough plays. I, it does make me wonder how soon Amarius Mims is going to be in this starting lineup once he gets healthy. But for the most part, I, I thought the offensive line and the run game looked pretty good. Um, they, they didn't really go under center very much. I, I only counted three plays, not including the, the Joe Burrow QB sneak. All of those, I believe, were play action passes, no runs out of under center. They did do three plays in pistol. Um, but overall, did, did you like what you saw from the run game or did you think they still have work to do there? Yeah, they definitely still have work to do. But you you saw it coming together in the second half when they were able to play off of what they were having success elsewhere. The first half, three straight three and outs and they're running on first down. And it, 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 it was just too predictable. But once you get at that first first down and then you get a rhythm going and then you can keep the defense guessing a little bit more then I thought it opened up and, it, you know, that, that touchdown drive, Zach Moss had four carries for 33 yards. All of them were in 12 personnel. And, and we, we've we talked about that. It looked like they were going to lean more into that this year. And they leaned into it on that drive, and it was the only drive they scored a touchdown mm-hmm. on. So I really do think – I know we're going to get into the Kansas City thing later, but I think you can see a lot more of it at Kansas City just because, number one, they had success. Number two, that's how you keep Patrick Mahomes off the field is you run the ball, you eat some clock, kind of – do the New York the, the New England Patriots mindset of what they did to Burrow? Forty eight plays for the Bengals on on Sunday. That's you. You just don't win a lot of games running that few plays unless a, a bunch of them are sixty yard touchdowns. Yeah, I think those twelve personnel runs with with sample and all on the field. I mean, I, I think mm-hmm. that was one of the positives that you have to look at if we're trying to find a positive from this game. Right? I think <laughs> you've got to look at that. They, I was surprised the Bengals didn't get more into the screen game. They they only yeah. we talked about the screen. They only did three screens, I, I believe. None to Chase Brown, who we saw last year have that amazing run against the Colts on a, on a screen blast. I, I kind of thought that, you know, given how difficult it was for guys to get open down the field, that they might have looked more into that screen game and tried to get more, get Brown or even Moss. Like Moss did have one screen, but try to get them more involved underneath. And maybe that's something they'll do next week. Um, I do want to talk about at the end of the game, the, the final fourth down, when the Bengals are pinned up against their up against their goal line, games on the line. Fourth and five, they they decide to punt there. Ben Baldwin's fourth down model says the Bengals should have gone for it. They had it as a 4.9% win probability added decision for, for Zach Taylor to go for it on that fourth down. It's, you know, I think most NFL coaches probably are going to punt there. They don't, they don't want to, I mean, if you if you don't get it, that fourth down conversion, the game is over. The Patriots can kick a field goal and end the game. I think I would have gone for it, honestly. I mean, you, you have not been able to stop. Ramondre Stevenson all day you you are banking on stopping the Patriots and, and not letting them get a couple first downs on the other side anything that adds more than like two percent win probability typically that that's like a must go situation to the so to be at almost five percent for me that would have been a go for it situation I guess I'm not surprised Zach Taylor didn't go for it but but I would have seen the logic there yeah there was a lot of booze in the stadium I I, I mean in the moment I was of the mindset that was the right thing to do because you're right the, the Bengals defense could have could have stoned them for n- no gain on three straight plays, but it's a gimme field goal. Then you're down two possessions and out of timeouts, and it, it was just a, it would have been a lot to ask if it was closer to the middle of the field where you you think you could you could get that stop and and force them to punt. Then yeah, I would go for it. But backed up that far in your own end, at your own fifteen. I mean, it's going to, like I said, a gimme field goal even if you stop them on three straight plays. So I, I didn't have a problem with the decision there um and especially it's yes they've been that stevenson have been running on them all game but you get them in a situation where you know they're going to run they have to run and you have i mean you have to trust your defense there and say okay we can we can get off the field and that 
that might have been the most disappointing part of, of the entire game. Yes, they gave up a ton of yards, ton of missed tackles and all that. But when everybody in the stadium knows exactly what's coming and, and they're still ripping off double-digit runs, that's when you really have to question this run defense. And I think that's why I would have gone for it. Like I, I, I think Zach Taylor saying he trusts his defense is kind of what coaches have to say. But I don't know how you could trust your defense after the game that yeah. that Stevenson had had. I, I mean, you're you were banking on stopping them. As I, I think trying to convert a fourth down, fourth down and five, even if you're backed up against the goal line, is is a better decision there than than banking on your defense. But we'll see what happens if the Bengals get in that position again. Um, I did now this one, maybe I'm a little too Madden brained for this, but I, I thought that after the Bengals made it 13, six, I thought they should have gone for two in that situation. I, I don't think you're going to see coaches do that much. I maybe in the future when coaches become more friendly with analytics, but you go for two there, you get it. It's 13 to eight. Even if the Patriots go on the other side and get a field goal, it's 16 to eight. It's still a one possession game. I mean, you're, you're down 13 to seven, the Patriots go and get a field goal, which they did. It's a two score game again. Time is running out. You know, I, I think I think coaches eventually will get more wise to those situations of trying to keep things in a one score game when time is running out. I, I'm not surprised Zach Taylor did not go for two there, but I, I thought that was a situation where maybe they could have given themselves a little bit of advantage by going for two there. Yeah, I didn't think about it in the moment, but you're right, because even worst case scenario, you don't get the two point conversion. Exactly. New England goes down and scores and goes for two and gets it. It's still 21 six. It's still a two possession game. You only need one two point conversion. So, yeah, I, I mean, that's an interesting that's an interesting thought. I didn't like I said, I didn't think of it in the moment, but. Um, I don't know. They, they like when the, the two point conversion first came out and they had these they had these go for it or go for one, go for two charts. I, yeah. I think that's totally gone out the window with analytics. I, I don't know if there's a new one now that's a standard. Um, it'd be interesting to see what it says for for that type of situation. I swear we got to get NFL head coaches playing playing one hour of Madden a week and all this stuff would be fixed. <laughs> I, I swear. Let's talk about the defense. Jay, I, I think the defense had some good moments. I mean, they they held the the Patriots to to not that many points, right? I mean, this was overall not that bad of a performance um, when you look at just points scored. But the underlying metrics, I think, were a little more disappointing. 118 of 100 of Ramondre Stevens, it's 120 rushing yards, came after contact, constantly missing tackles, right? PFF had them with 13 missed tackles on the week, which was second most among all NFL teams. They had Geno Stone with three missed tackles, Dax with two, Hubbard with two. It was just a game where they got kind of out physical, I think, for the for the most part in the run game. And Jacoby Brissett made some plays too. You have to give him credit. I mean, three rushing first downs for a guy who's not exactly the fastest quarterback in the world. I thought he showed some good mobility. He had a few nice throws, but I think this performance against a, a Patriots offense that, man, would you say it's the worst in the league, second worst in the league? The the end result is undoubtedly disappointing. Yeah, and, and the missed tackles are—it's just—it's got to be maddening. I mean, Lou Anarumo talked about it last week. He—he he was lamenting how bad the run defense was last year and how he—he he was confident it was going to be better this year. And he, he said, "I hate to keep going back to it. But we had two hundred some yards of um, after contact last year, <laughs> and it's one hundred and thirty-eight in one game this year. I mean, Stevenson third had one eighteen. Antonio Gibson had twenty. I just." I, I have a different metric. I, I, I was using Sport Radar, and they had him with mm. ten missed tackles. And as bad as things were last year, the Bengals never had a game with ten mass, missed tackles. Last time they had more than ten missed tackles was twenty twenty two, that Monday night game at Cleveland when the Browns just ran all over them. You look at the missed tackles; they had Dax with three missed tackles. Those plays: fourteen yard gain for Stevenson, sixteen yard gain for Stevenson, nine yard gain for Stevenson. They had Geno with two missed tackles. They were both on plays when Dax also missed tackles. Uh, Von Bell had a missed tackle. That was a 17-yard gain for Stevenson. B.J. Hill had one. That was a 12-yard gain. And Pratt had one. And that was a, an Antonio Gibson yard gain for eight. So like, not all missed tackles are, yeah. are equal. Sometimes you miss one and then somebody else is right there to rally. And, and, and that's not what was happening. These, these were guys in the open field missing them a lot. You know, the, the ones where Dax is flying in and he just whiffs and then the field's wide open and it's an explosive run. So uh, Lou didn't feel – or not Lou. We didn't get a chance to talk to Lou yet. We'll talk to him tomorrow. But the, the players in the locker room, you know, especially Logan Wilson – said he thought scheme wise everything was there the run fits were there they were in the right position where they needed to be the 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 positioning of the technique was 
what he took issue with. Because I was asking him, you know, about, well, how do you fix mix, missed tackles like that when you guys never do anything? You don't, there's no live periods in training camp and you don't do it in the season either. It's tackling drills, but you're not actually taking guys to the ground. And he, he said, it's not so much the technique of getting guys on the ground. It's, it's the technique of being in the right position and being on the right shoulder and, and everything that goes into before you actually wrap the guy to take him down. Um, and it's something they have to get fixed because, I mean, again, Isaiah Pacheco breaks tackles regularly. He yes. does it to good teams. Uh, imagine what he's going to do against the Bengals. Imagine what a, some, a fired up Samaj P. Ryan's going to do to see his old team when he gets some chances. So, yeah, it, it's, it's a pretty urgent thing that has to get fixed. Let's look at the pass rush. Uh, per True Media, the Bengals pressured Brissett on 44.8% of his dropbacks, which was the most any quarterback was pressured in week one. It didn't really feel like that, though, because they, did, they didn't really finish as much as you would like. Trey, Trey Hendrickson, 26.1% pass rush win rate, seventh highest among edge rushers in week one, but no sacks, right? Sheldon Rankins, 11.8% pass rush, pass rush win rate. No other Bengals defender was above 10%. So I think there's an issue of if you've got one pass rusher who's constantly winning, which Trey Anderson was, but you've got no one there to pick up the slack, right? You've got no one there to, to get a cleanup sack. There, there was a third and two at the start of the fourth quarter where Trey Hendrickson beat the Patriots left tackle almost instantly, almost instantly gets a win. Sheldon Rankins is right there to clean up, and he he really should have got the sack or at least taken Brissett down. Brissett just kind of gets right by him, kind of evades a tackle, and, and gets a first down a rushing attempt. I think you saw that a couple times where – Hendrickson was getting pressure. He was getting to Brissett. Brissett was just able to escape. And whether it's the other Bengals defensive linemen, whether it's Jermaine Pratt and Logan Wilson, who I think Logan Wilson did have a great game. He had several pressures as a, as a blitzer from the second level as well. But I, I think there were opportunities there where Brissett could have been stopped before. I mean, three rushing first downs for a, for a player of Brissett's caliber who is not a rusher, who's not a mobile guy. is just, it's not what you want. Um, and going back to the missed tackles, you know, I think Geno Stone had to, Kind of a bad game for his first Bengals debut. He should have had an interception in the end zone. Mm -hmm. it, it was a, on that near touchdown by, I think it was Hunter Henry. It, 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 he should have picked that ball off. He had two or three missed tackles, which we mentioned. And, and missed tackles, as good as Geno Stone was for the Ravens last year with seven interceptions and playing well in coverage, 19% missed tackle rate for the Ravens yeah. in 2023, 11th worst among all safeties. So I think that is an area of his game where he could get better as his first season in the Bengals, as a Bengal goes along. Um, there were just some other other concerns, man, that I just thought were just kind of shocking. Like Austin Hooper beating Jermaine Pratt for first downs. <laughs> like, how how does that happen? Austin Hooper is not a guy who who is getting yards after the catch or who has really been involved much in past games. He's he's a blocking tight end for the most part. You know, I, there was a there was a play at third and two with about 145 before halftime that I just had to bring up. The Bengals are are playing a soft zone coverage, it's kind of near the goal line. Patriots are trying to run out the clock. It's a third and two. They just run a mesh concept, right, with, with two crossers over the middle. we all seen mesh. If you play Madden, the receivers are supposed to get so close that they can basically high five. Cam Taylor Britt is not really close enough to K.J. Osborne, who just sits right down the middle, gets the first down, enables the Patriots to run out the clock. They kick a field goal. It's 10 nothing. I that situation, I think you've got to know down in distance. It's third and two. The, the Bengals had three deep defenders guarding, I think it was Hunter Henry in the end zone. I, you don't think the Patriots are going for a touchdown in that situation. They're probably trying to get a first down, extend the clock, and make sure the Bengals don't get the ball back. I, I think little things like that, knowing situational, knowing situations, and what you mentioned too, technique, being in the right spot. I, I think it's all stuff they're going to have to clean up. Hopefully it's just week one and they'll get past that, but it's all very undoubtedly disappointing after week one. Yeah. So Hendrickson, he was, he was really good. And, and Sam Hubbard was not, he, you know, he, he just didn't get a lot of pressure. And you think about they talked about how they were going to have to limit Jamar chase because he didn't practice all the training camp and neither did Sam Hubbard. Sam Hubbard got hurt first yeah. week. It might've been the second day of, of camp and he hardly practiced at all. And yet he played the lion's share of the snaps. I mean, Joseph Osai had 13 snaps. You know, where was he? I, I think a big part of that was Sam is still a very good run defender. And they and the Patriots were running the ball so much. I don't think they wanted to take Sam off the field. But there were so many times when Trey Hendrickson was just getting pushed a little. I mean, Jacoby Brett. J J Jacoby Brissett, I'm sure, smelled his breath on multiple of those pass <laughs> rushes, but he just never was able to get a hold of him. And Sam, 
Trace spent a lot of time pointing at the video board and t- trying to get the ref to watch the replay, complaining he was getting held. And he, he always gets held. But that's the thing. If, if he's going to get there and get that pressure and you're going to force Brissett off the spot, somebody else has to be there to clean up, and it just wasn't there. Um, I don't I don't think it's a, a huge concern because I do think we are going to see Osai get more snaps as this goes on along, and they play teams that aren't as reliant on the run as New England. And you still got Miles Murphy coming back at some point. I mean, it's probably going to be four weeks. At, well, it's going to be four weeks at least. Yeah. But it, 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 the indication is he's going to be ready to go by week five against Baltimore. So that's going to be a huge boost to the pass rush. But, yeah, you've, you've got to get that interior push. And, and it just wasn't there. Um, and, and that was, you know, one of the, the biggest concerns is just – when Hendrickson's rushing like that and whipping his guy, he can't do it alone. You got to have somebody else there. And, and it just wasn't there all day. Um, and, and the missed tackles, again, that's just something that it, it's got to get cleaned up. You, you, you feel like it, it, it's not going to be like that all year. You, a lot of times I was, I asked Zach about that. He's like, is this just something you have to live with in week one when, when you're not tackling and mm-hmm. in, in tanny camp and, and he didn't want to put the blame on not having live periods. He he went to the same spot Logan did about it's about technique and getting that technique right, and they're going to keep drilling it in practice. But, yeah, the, the, the pass rush has to get better. The secondary pass rush beyond Trey Hendrickson and then the tackling, obviously, that goes without saying. I did think on the interior that J2 Faley had a nice game. He had a, a yeah. really nice run stop in the first quarter near the goal line. He had a couple other good stops. Um, if we're trying to find positives for this game, which I, I think are probably few and far between, Andre Yoshvaz, 100% of the snaps. Yeah, I d- didn't make a ton of huge plays, but I think just yeah. getting out there and being on the field was, was pretty impressive. Zach Moss, we mentioned, 4.9 yards per carry, four targets in the receiving game. Offensive line, again, outside of Trent Brown, who, you, you know, you mentioned Sam Hubbard didn't practice during the summer very much. Trent Brown didn't practice very much either. So I think it's, yeah. it's fair to give him a little bit of a break here early on and make see if he's better in week two. Uh, the Bengals were third in FTN's adjusted line yards, which, which tries to divvy up credit for the rushing attack between the running back and the offensive line. So I think from that perspective, you're pretty happy with how they played in the run game. Other positives, I think, Ravens and Browns also lost in week one. <laughs> the Browns, yeah. did not, Browns did not look good at all. Deshaun Watson looked about like the same quarterback we saw last season. Steelers won, but didn't look that great. What they didn't score a touchdown. 15, 15 or 18 total points with Justin Fields against the Falcons. So there are some things, I think, a little bit of silver lining we can look at. But it's for the most part, it's, a, it's another disappointing week one game. And I guess we can look forward to week two now. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that is that's what the the coaches were talking about yesterday. Is you got to bury it. They they had a two o'clock staff meeting. Um, <laughs> the, the the locker room was open to the media from two to three. The the staff meeting was going on at two. That's usually like a three to five minute meeting. It was a fifteen minute meeting. It was or close to fifteen. I think it was more like thirteen. And when that let out, they nobody stopped it. A few people stopped at their locker, but most of the guys mm-hmm. grabbed their stuff and went home. They were done for the day. They weren't interested in rehashing it. Uh, they know that what the questions are is, is, you know, everything that went wrong in that game. And then the, the dreaded, is this a must win going to Kansas city in week two? Nobody wanted any part in answering that, but the, it, it, Dan pitcher talked about it. The offense coordinators, you got to bury that game. We, we had that meeting. It's over. It's done with. You can learn from it. Absolutely. You got to stop thinking about it. Got to move on to Kansas city. Things are about to get a lot more difficult, right? I mean, we, we don't need to tell you that. that you, everyone knows who Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid and the Chiefs are. Uh, the Bengals are six-point road underdogs this week in Kansas City. Jay, you're going to be at this game. You're going to be in Kansas City watching this live. It's, it's you know, it's hard to even preview a team like the Chiefs because like, we know who Patrick Mahomes is. We know what, he, what he's capable of. We know what this offense is capable of. We know that the Chiefs now have a top five, maybe top three defense. It, it's... It's a really, really difficult unit to plan for. If I'm looking at a couple things, you know, if I'm looking at the Chiefs offense, I think you've got to be concerned about what Rasheed Rice is going to do over the middle of the field. He he went off for the for the Chiefs against the Ravens last week. The Chiefs were constantly getting him lined up against linebackers, against bigger players who just had no hope of covering him over the middle of the field. Then you add on top of that a guy like Xavier Worthy who can do all sorts of things deep down the field, who can – get those explosive chunk plays that the Bengals had so many issues with last year. We saw him score on an end around in week one. Then you've got Isaiah Pacheco, who can, is he going to go for 175 yards against this Bengals defense? You know, if Ramondi Stevenson can do what he did, what does Pacheco do with a much better offensive line? 
I think there are a lot of questions here. If you're looking at this offense, Jay, what what would you be most concerned about from the Bengals' perspective as you go into week two? Well, you mentioned all those concerns, and they still have Travis Kelsey too. That's I mean, he's he's aging, and he didn't have a great game against the Ravens, but the, the tight ends have traditionally been a thorn in the side for the Bengals. So that's another thing to to worry about. I mean, I, I think the the number one thing that you you, you worry about is is it, I go back to that game against Houston last year and you you get you play a quarterback capable of extending plays and that they just it it's a hard to plaster for that long and um yes they've revamped the secondary but um that pass rush better be on top of of Mahomes I mean the book is you don't blitz that guy and we saw them do this to Jacoby a couple of times where they only rushed three and dropped eight and that was kind of the key to the success in their comeback in that 2021 AFC Championship game. So I wonder if if Lou goes back to that and and just rushes three, but you're playing with fire with that too because it, the, eventually someone's going to come open and you've got explosive guys all over the field. I mean, Rasheed Rice is incredibly fast, worthy, two touchdowns in his debut, and, and then Kelsey just finds a way to to work his way open. It you know whether even in a zone or whatever the defense is, so. I, I don't know that the number one concern is always going to be Mahomes and defending him, um, and, and then offensively for the Bengals and then defensively for the Chiefs. I mean, Chris Jones is just he just uh, so unique and his size and his get off for a man of that size and his ability to move around. They we saw in the championship game in twenty twenty two they played him out at defensive end a lot. Um, he could be a nightmare. And if you're talking about Joe Burrow still kind of feeling a little bit of effects of the wrist, you don't want to see him going to the ground very often. And, and Chris Jones has a tendency to, to get to the quarterbacks and and take them to the ground, sack them or hit them even after they get rid of the ball. Um, it could be a huge game for, for Volson, Kappa, and Ted Karras to try to keep Chris Jones somewhat in check. Yeah, I think – Chris Jones is is my pick for defensive player of the year. Like I really think this is going to be the year he finally gets it. He had six pressures in week one against the Ravens. So did George Karloftis, the defensive end. Yeah. Tashawn Wharton, who's like a typically a run defender, had four. Leo Chanel had three from the second level. You, you know Steve Spagnuolo, the Chiefs defensive coordinator, is going to dial up some creative blitzes. He's going to be rushing from every level. There's going to be a lot to account for, I think, for the Bengals' offensive line. So hopefully they kind of show that cohesion that I think they had in week one. Um I think the Bengals could some have some success running the ball. That KC was 27th to run defense DVOA in 2023. Last weekend, the Ravens, they were 31st in rushing success rate of, of all teams in week one. Admittedly, that's against Lamar Jackson and Derrick Henry. You know, obviously, teams are going to have some struggles when they play a rushing offense like that. But 31st in rushing success rate in week one. Chiefs linebacker Nick Bolton, I thought, had a lot of struggles against the run in week one i think that's maybe an area of the field you can attack if he's assuming he's still starting which i'm assuming he will be cornerback i think is interesting for the for the chiefs as well trent mcduffie was a first team all pro last year but they lost legerious need they traded into the titans this offseason so they've got you know jalen watson playing back there joshua williams Jamari connor seeing time in the slot it's a more inexperienced group than they had in the past couple seasons so maybe you could beat them for a couple plays or hope there's a couple coverage busts but Again, that's hope. That's not exactly a strategy. Um, going back to the offense, Chiefs offense for one second. Chiefs, I think, do have a top five offensive line, and they are it's much stronger, especially on the interior, than the Patriots were. But they do have a rookie left tackle in Kingsley Suamatia, who in week one was the definite weak point of that offensive line. I, I think for a second round rookie at a BYU, he he was actually decent, but he was the weakest part of that offensive line. So if Trey Hendrickson's lined up again, lined up against him repeatedly if he can if he can win and the rest of the Bengals defensive line is there to clean up I I do think that's an area where maybe they could have a little bit of success is attacking that rookie left tackle yeah and as far as the run game goes I mean like we said earlier you go to that 12 personnel package and yeah you know you 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 force the Chiefs to make a decision do they want to pull a DB off the field put another linebacker in play base and, and then you start having a little bit of success, you, the play action game starts working. You can get Chase in a, in a one-on-one -on -one or even Yoshi Voss in a one-on-one -on -one down the field. Um, and then you get, if you've got a team that's blitzing the heck out of you, like we expect Kansas City to do, that's where the screen game really can come in. And I, I do, I think yeah. this could be a Chase Brown kind of game where you just leak the ball out to him and, and, and let him get in the open field and see what he can do. 
Um, you know, Dan Pitcher talked about that, where that was disappointing. They they really do want it to be more of a 50-50 split, um, and, and it wasn't at all. It was more of a two-to-one split with Zach Moss to Chase Brown because they were so limited on plays against the Patriots. So I do think they're going to – find a way to, to make sure they get Chase Brown on the field more and the ball in his hands more against the Chiefs. Yeah. That, it, one last point that made me think when you mentioned the, the 12 personnel, when, when the, so the Patriots ran, I think it was like 18 plays with six offensive linemen. The Bengals were consistently matching that with nickel personnel, which I thought was kind of weird. Mm-hmm. Like I, I thought they wanted to get bigger bodies on the field. They did use a five down, a five man line a couple of times. Like when the bank, when the Patriots had six offensive linemen and two tight ends in there, but Man, it was kind of surprising to see you're bringing in another big body, a sixth offensive lineman, and the Bengals are out there with still with five defensive backs. Not exactly surprising you're getting gashed in that situation. Yeah, the I'm... Chiefs, I don't know if the I don't remember the Chiefs using a lot of sixth offensive linemen, but they will definitely dip into multiple tight end sets. Mm-hmm. Just wonder if maybe Lou Anarumo looks at last week and says, maybe I should get some bigger bodies out there. Maybe ADG should be out there. Um you know, even if it's even if it's the bigger nickel packages, we, we we saw Dejan Anthony come in for a couple of those big nickel packages on on third and long situations. But maybe, you know, you, you go with a little bit bigger bodies to try and stop the run if Kansas City is loading up with with tight ends or or if they went to a six offensive line attack. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see if they do that. And I I, I was surprised it was Dejan Anthony played the first two third downs of the game and he never played yeah. again. And, um, and no like Jordan, 80, no Jordan battle the entire no game. No Jordan was, battle was, at all. Yeah. And ADG did play more snaps than he typically does he in a non-Ravens game. Um, but, yeah, I, I did. I thought we would see uh, more three linebacker sets. But, um, it, again, it's 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 week one for everybody. They're trying to figure one. it out and trying to to see what works, what doesn't work. And um, it, it's it's going to be, you know, beyond the fact that it's Burrow and Mahomes and, and you know, teams that have, I don't know, a combined however many AFC championship games in the last four years – um, the just that that X and O part of it is it's it's always intriguing when these two get together because uh, you've got veteran guys in, in Spagnolo and, and Anarumo that are that can dial up anything and um, it's it's going to be a fun game to watch. I don't think and, and this is so you just you remove yourself from it where you know we know the Bengals we cover the Bengals we know them so well everybody knows what the Chiefs is. I just I always look at week two. And teams that have huge wins are due for a letdown. And teams that lose and lose in stunning fashion like the Bengals almost always bounce back. You just you just kind of take the names and faces out of it and, and you you try to you try to play off of the overreaction part of it. And I it's a six point spread right now. I expect this to be a close game. I know a lot of people are like, oh, they're gonna go in there and get their doors blown off. I don't think so. I, I'm not. I'm not predicting a win, but I, I think this is going to be a really interesting tight game. Yeah, and it's you hate to call a game this early a must win game, but and I don't have the numbers in front of me, but we all know starting zero and two is almost a, almost a death sentence for for an NFL team in terms of getting to the playoffs. The Bengals have been an exception, obviously, in that regard. They they have shown in the past an ability to win games down the stretch and come back from these terrible starts, but. You, you hate to do that every year, obviously. And, and to go down 0-2 again, I, I think, would be hard to come back from. I, I think that even if the Bengals do lose um, on Sunday, I think there's a couple things you want to see. You want to see Joe Burrow take more deep shots and just feel more comfortable as a passer. You, you want to see the guy that we that we know he can be. You want to see a guy who's willing to let it rip a little bit more. On defense, you, you want to see no explosive plays or lack of explosive plays. I don't think you're going to fully limit Patrick Mahomes to no explosive plays, but keep those to a minimum and make the tackles. I think if those three things happen on Sunday, win or lose, you, you will feel pretty good about the Bengals, even if they're rowing two. I, I think if those three things happen, you, you'll feel okay moving into week three. Dallas, this may surprise you, but I do have the numbers. Um, since, since 1990, when they expanded it to 12 playoff teams, it's 14 now, but when they really yeah. bumped it up in 1990, 279 teams have started 0-2. 32 have made the playoffs. It's 11 and a half percent. 2022 Bengals are in that mix, but yeah, it's, it is a tough hill to climb and it, and it helps too that not only have they expanded it from 12 teams to 14, they've added that 17th game. So it does right. give you a little more uh, room to play with. Nobody wants to be 0 and 2. And even you think about it, like you said, if, if, if they do those things and, and they, they show that growth and you, you feel a little bit better about it, even 0 and 2, you're still talking about Washington and Carolina in week three and week four. And it, and it's, it, it wouldn't be crazy to think that they could be two and two 
with a little momentum with Baltimore coming into Cincinnati in week five. So again, I, I, I would not, I know from a mentality standpoint that the Bengals, they look at every game as a must win. And certainly this yeah. one, certainly if, if you're entertaining any hopes of home field advantage or, you know, a great playoff seed, but it's not a death sentence if they if they lose this game. I, I do think they number one, just the way it lays out. Number two, as unfortunate as it, it is, they've been through this multiple times. They know how to, to dig themselves out of a hole. They would like to not have to do it. The fans would love for them not to have to do it, but it, it's something that they've proven they can do. Week one was I would say was a debacle. That's for sure. I, I don't. I wouldn't call it a debacle if they lose in week two. If they lose and go zero and three and lose to the Commanders, I'll I'll say disaster. If if they lose to the Panthers in Week Four, I don't even know if there's a word for it. What, what that would be? I if anybody, eat. if anybody watched the Panthers yesterday, good God! I mean, I cannot remember an NFL team looking that bad. Bryce Young, I'm sorry, man. It, I don't think he's an NFL caliber quarterback at this at this point. I'm not sure if he ever will be. It, it was so rough. I, I know we think that we kind of had a lower view of the Patriots going into this game, but they are far and away more talented than what the Panthers are right now. So once we get to week four, we can talk about that, but I don't think we're quite in disaster mode just yet. I, I think it could get there late in the year, but I, I don't think we're there quite yet. Uh, anything else, Jay, on this week one debacle on next week on what's coming up? Enjoy your trip to KC, of course. I, I think there will be some barbecue involved, I hope. I'm assuming there will be some adult beverages involved. I don't know what else you've got. Know, planned, I, but I, yeah. I, I, so my dad lives out there, yeah. so I'm going to stay with him. Um, I, I don't know. It, it, I, I'm sure there'll be a beer or two at dinner, but it's not going to be a crazy like a normal Saturday night when I'm out with all the beat writers. Um, I'm, I'm just going to take it easy, go wherever he wants to go. I, I, maybe, you know, I'm old. He's older. Maybe he wants to do like a four o'clock dinner on Saturday right go. after the plane lands. And so, Early bird special. But, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's always great to see him and um, I am looking forward to the trip, but it's going to be a little bit different. The last few trips out there have have been some uh, some late nights and some uh, some tired game days, and uh, I know I'll be fresh, especially with the four twenty five start on Sunday. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's always fun going out there, and it's 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 becoming a thing. What is this? I think this is going to be the sixth time that they yeah. played. Um, Burrow's three and one against Mahomes. I. I don't think anybody else is anywhere close to that kind of win percentage against Patrick Mahomes. So, um, you know, it's, it's you will see how healthy Burrow actually is. But anytime he's back there, you feel they have a shot. And I, I do. I think this is going to be a really fun, intriguing game to watch on Sunday. Yeah, I can't wait for it. I'm sure Bengals fans, Bengals fans can't wait for it. We've been waiting for this since the schedule came out, right? Waiting for this game. Uh, everybody enjoy the game. We will be back next week to recap everything. We'll talk to you then. We'll